Well, welcome to the second session of Technology on the Bible. And it's fun to go through some of these little nuggets of technology in terms of our biblical perspective. But this time we're going to do something a little different. We're going to explore what some people might consider the frontiers of science itself. And uh, we're going to take a look at the information sciences as such, which is probably the newest of the sciences. You know, you can go take chemistry and physics and not get past the 17th century in college. And uh, information science has really emerged in the uh, 20th century. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about the search for extraterrestrial life that gets that uh, there's some lessons to be learned from some of those efforts. We'll talk about what the Green Bank formula is and what it might mean for each of us. Well, this will lead us into a quick summary of the anthropic principle, which is a secular concept, but one that is very provocative to anyone that's looking at these issues. But where we're really headed is we're going to explore the boundaries of our physical reality. It has boundaries. We want to understand those. We're going to talk a little bit about the constants of physics and some big surprises there. Talk a little bit about space and hyperspaces. Talk about information sciences as a wrap-up. And talk about the ultimate quest that we all have and the resources available. So the search for extraterrestrial life, a subject of a lot of writings of, by various authors. And uh, uh, we have huge investments of equipment that are looking at the distant stars, looking for signals. And they speak of the Green Bank formula. This was the structure by which scientists would meet in, in uh, Booker Town in uh, the National Academy of Sciences in, in uh, Russia back in 71, hosted 84 of the top scientists from around the world to explore this idea of extraterrestrial life. And they adopted what they call the uh, uh, Green Bank formula and uh, the, the, to try to estimate the number of civilizations in a galaxy capable of interstellar communication. How'd they come to that? Well, R was the average rate at which stars develop during the lifetime of a galaxy. There is uh, uh, presumptions about that by the astrophysicists. The FP is the fraction of those stars that might have planets. And E is the number of those planets per star that were capable of supporting life. Then out of those, there's a fraction of those with life. And then there's a fraction of those that have intelligent life. And then there's a fraction of those planets with intelligent life capable of interstellar communication. The idea is to concatenate those probabilities. And then uh, L is the average lifetime of a society capable of interstellar communication. It turns out each one of those draws upon a different field of science. But by what they concluded after exploring all these things, and you can get the proceedings of this through the MIT Press, as fascinating reading because as you can pool what we think we know about the universe, they come to the conclusion that life is an exception. Life, the using this kind of an approach, it's clear that the, 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 the probabilities against it keep concatenating to make life increasingly unlikely. In their words, it obviously is a singularity or a miracle. And, and there's no other. Uh, so from this, it's a very pessimistic conclusion to the probability of encountering extraterrestrial intelligence. And that's, we think that's kind of interesting. But out of all of this kind of th thinking, you encounter a thing called the anthropic principle. This is a secular term, not, a, not one generated by uh, biblical observers. And yet it's what, the, what they call it the anthropic principle because it appears as we put everything we think we know about the universe together mathematically, it appears that it was all designed for man. That's why they call it anthropic principle. And uh, Paul Davies, a uh, secular scientist of some note, summarizes it seems as though somebody has fine-tuned the, the nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. His words. It's interesting that in many schools today it's illegal to teach truth but, uh, or the existence of design. But the, the anthropic principle, the appearance that the universe was designed for man, and uh, every, if we put everything we know, what we, uh, what we think we know, together, and we alter it in just the least little bit, life turns out to be impossible. And in fact, some factors, as little as one part in 10 to the 55th, and life ceases to happen. Let me give you an example. There are only four forces known throughout the universe. Gravity, electromagnetic force, and two nuclear forces, a strong nuclear force and a weak nuclear force. These four forces are all that have ever been experienced. 
Now, gravity, most people understand what that is. That's what causes an apple to fall to the ground. That keeps our feet on the floor. It also binds our solar system together. It keeps the Earth and the planets in their orbits. And it prevents the stars from exploding. That's, what, that's gravity. It guides the galaxies in their motion. So gravity operates in the microcosm, the small things. It also operates, it's the, it's the dominant thing in the macrocosm. Another force that's distinctly different is the electromagnetic force. It's what holds an atom together. It determines the structure of the orbits of the electrons and therefore what molecules make sense. It governs the laws of chemistry, therefore. And it also forms, uh, forms of electromagnetic uh, forces include x-rays, radio waves, light, are all in that category. Electromagnetic forces can overcome gravity on the Earth. It can dominate the other forces down to the size of the nucleus of an atom, and there things start to change. We encounter the strong nuclear force that binds the protons and neutrons and the nucleus of the atom. We have the balance between the strong force and the electromagnetic forces that force a nucleus to be something less than 100 protons. That's why a periodic table has essentially 100 elements in it, because of that balance. Energy released by the strong nuclear force is essentially greater than the energy from an electromagnetic force, and that's the, the chemical forces. The, it, it, strong nuclear force is why stars shine, and it's also essential, essential for life. There's a weak nuclear force that governs atomic instability and radioactivity, the disintegration of the heavier nuclei. And it can create heat, such as the decay of radioactive materials in the Earth's core and, or in a nuclear power plant. It's the weak nuclear force that's providing us the energy from that. Well, there's a gravitational coupling that we have always in, in, in notice in the uh, universe. If the gravitational coupling was just a little bit stronger, all stars more massive than our sun by 1.4 times, they would burn too rapidly and too co constantly to maintain life-supporting conditions. So you wouldn't have life if the gravitational coupling happened to be a little stronger. If it was a little bit weaker, all stars would be less than 0.8 times the mass of the sun. There would be no heavy elements. So that all falls apart. The electromagnetic coupling. If it was weaker, molecules for life would cease to exist. If it was stronger, again, molecules for life would cease to exist. See, this is the force that binds the protons in atoms, determines the degree of atomic bonding, and, uh, well, the strong force coupling. If it was slightly weaker, multi-proton nuclei would not hold together. Hydrogen would be the only element in the universe. If it was slightly stronger, nuclear particles would tend to bond together more frequently and more firmly. Hydrogen would be rare in the universe, and the supply of various life essential elements would be heavier than iron would be insufficient. The weak force coupling also. If it was larger, there'd be no helium, no heavy elements. If it was weaker, there, everything would be helium. There would be an overabundance of heavy elements. If you take the ratio of the electron to the proton mass, if it was larger, molecules would not form. Life would be impossible. If it was slightly smaller, molecules would not form. Life would be impossible. How about the distance from the sun? If we were closer, it would be too warm to maintain a stable water cycle. If we were further away, it would be too, too cold to have a stable water cycle. Surface gravity. If it was stronger, the, 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 the atmosphere would have too much ammonia and methane. It was like most of the planets uh, in our solar system have. Yeah. If it was weaker, the atmosphere would lose too much water. The thickness of the Earth's crust, I'm just giving, there's over a hundred of these, I'm just giving you a sampling here. The thickness of the Earth's crust, if it was thicker, there'd be too much oxygen would be transferred from the atmosphere to the crust. If it was thinner, the volcanic and tectonic activity would be too great. The Earth's rotational period, don't take that for granted. If, if it was longer, the diurnal temperature differences would be too great for life. If it was shorter, the atmospheric wind velocities would be too great. So, actual tilt. If it was greater, surface temperatures would be too great. And if it was less, the surface temperature would be too great. That, that actual tilt is, is, is what puts it all in balance. Critical factors here. We've, sp we've spoken of all these different coupling con uh, 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 constants and the distance from the sun, surface gravity, and so forth. The thickness of the crust, the rotation, the actual tilt. The albedo, the reflectivity of the Earth is also critical. A little more, a little less, life would be impossible. The Earth's magnetic field, strangely enough, has to be strong enough to keep the radiation away. The ozone level, this is the one, I love this one, the ozone level. It turns out 
that if it was just a little bit different, um, all life would be impossible. Now, let's just take this one as an example. If it's that sensitive, you know, the, cause, the, the ecologists like to say, gee, if the ozone layer, you know, increases or decreases by a fraction of 1%, cosmic doom occurs. Well, if it's that delicate, who balanced it in the first place? And who is maintaining its balance even today? The CO2 and water vapor level is the same, uh, the same kind of thing. So evidence in the microcosm. At the atomic and subatomic level, the slightest variation in any of these primary constants of physics, um, some, uh, some as sensitive as one part in a billion, causes life to be impossible. And we have that many factors, each of which is that delicate, that all makes life a very, very rare thing indeed and implies not only elegance of design, but elegance in maintenance that, to maintain those relationships. And so the more these relationships are, the more unequivocally they reveal both two things, skillful design in their origin and diligence in their maintenance. You know, we've invented the most insulting god of all. We talk about pagan cultures that worshipped gods of wood and iron and bronze, whatever. We've invented the most insulting god of all. Randomness. The total absence of information. We argue that all this elegance of design we see in the universe, in leaves, plants, animals, and ourselves, was all some kind of operation of randomness? That's utter nonsense. In fact, it defies the very definition of randomness. And uh, so we need to understand what some opposites. Disorder and order are opposites. Noise and signal are opposites. Engineers work hard to improve the signal-to-noise ratio of a receiver or a communication uh, system. Music and cacophony are opposites. Perhaps hard to discern today, but the co co chaos and cosmos are Greek terms for opposites, where cosmos is order and chaos is disorder. Randomness and design are opposites. The things on the left are examples of what's called entropy or randomness. Disorder, noise, cacophony, chaos, those are all forms of randomness or forms of maximum entropy. On the right here, we have the opposite of that. Order, signals, music, cosmos, design, evidence of design. We need to understand those are opposites. It's amazing how many administrators today have no grasp that randomness and design are opposed to one another. In fact, we notice in the universe the flow, the natural flow, in the absence of intervention, the flow is always towards entropy, towards randomness. You notice that in your school locker at, at school. You notice that in the closet at home, the garage. You spend a half a day Saturday straightening it all out. It doesn't stay that way, does it? It goes towards randomness unless you assert the energy and the deliberate design to reorder things. It's interesting, the anthropic principle actually was used predictively. In 1954, Sir Fred Hoyle even predicted and then did discover the previously unknown energy levels in the carbon-12 atom. And he, this came about because he was sensitive to the, the patterns of numerical design in the universe. So he predicted that there would be a, a resonance involving helium-4, beryllium-8, and carbon-12. The mass energy of the nu each nucleus is fixed and cannot change. The kinetic energy depends upon the internal star temperature, which can be calculated. He predicted there must be previously undetected energy levels. And he, he predicted it. Exper subsequent experiments confirmed him. And he's knighted over all this. He applied the uh, anthropic principle to predict in advance, not by hindsight, the energy level at 7.6 million electron volts. Anyway, there's another discovery that amplifies the anthropic principle that I think is even more provocative. And uh, it's interesting, not only is, the, is, is our planet positioned for life uniquely, the right distance from the sun, the right size, the right speeds, all those things, it's also uniquely positioned for discovery. And uh, it's positioned in the galaxy in such a way as to be able to see the rest of the galaxy. It's positioned for total eclipses. Now what's that got to do with anything? The idea of having a solar eclipse, that the moon is just the right size and the right distance to exactly obscure the sun except for the corona, is a very delicate mathematical relationship. Because it exists, it allows us to discover spectroscopy. 
and uh, that 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 it's, so. And we're also positioned within the visible spectrum in such a way as to learn. If you change any of those things, we often life doesn't exist, but also we would not be able to discover what's going on. What this all implies, strangely enough, isn't that it's just designed for life. It's designed for teleology. It's, it's a. Per, it's not even designed. That's clear. It also has been designed deliberately to be discovered. And The Privileged Planet, I encourage you to check the book by Gonzalez and Richards, and there's some fabulous DVDs out on that uh, that are just breathtaking in their scope. But the information sciences is where we're headed, and there are two concepts that are effective for us in, 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 uh, conceptually, but not in practice. One is randomness, entropy. The universe has two, most of us have been taught with what we call deterministic uh, 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 mathematics. Two plus two is four, always. And th that's deter most engineers are taught on deterministic mathematics. But there's another field of mathematics, stochastic variables, where you're dealing, say, with the average height of a man. What is that? Well, it has a range. It has a dispersion. It's, it's, a, it's a body of information that is variable but has certain characteristics. That's a stochastic and it turns out in this world, you often search for and need to have the use of a random number. It turns out you can't get one. You can get a pseudo-random number, something that's almost random, but the very act of getting the number implies some procedure, and that procedure is very likely to be subject to some kind of design. Getting a random number is a challenge to the technical community. The Rand Corporation, the granddaddy think tank of them all, in 1955, published a book which at that time was a, uh, a, a milestone. It was a book called One Million Random Digits with 100,000 Normal Deviates. And a layman looking at that would laugh. Here is a book. If you look at that book, I have one. I meant to bring it. Um, a Million Random Digits. When I was there at Rand, I got one because I, I, and I, I began to appreciate it as, as the years went by. It's simply a book of random numbers. Now, the, the naive observer would laugh at that, just random numbers. No, the numbers are as random as a computer can make them. What it means is that, there's no, that each number that follows is not predictable. There's no symmetry. There's no periodicity. There's, it, 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 it has been washed by supercomputers every way they could conceive to make sure there's no patterns. It's truly random, very difficult to achieve, and it was considered a milestone at the time. So it is, its defining characteristic is that its total absence of design. Design and randomness are opposite to each other. And to attribute our design of ourselves, our universe, to randomness is to not understand the very nature of what the word means. And so... The scripture says a little bit about this. The lot is cast in the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. In other words, the, the, the way Einstein said, God does not play dice. Do you know why? <laughs> if he did, he'd win. God's in control. Now, th there's a whole field of study because of the elusiveness of true randomness. It's called chaos theory. It's a new field of mathematics which tries to get at this fact that r randomness is elusive. You can't find it. But there's a more interesting area that I want to explore, and that's infinity. We all use that word in school, but um, what is infinity really? Well, it has two dimensions on the, in terms of largeness, how big is the universe, and the great discovery of 20th century science is the universe is finite. It's not infinite. It may be expanding, but it's not infinite. And uh, that's at the macrocosm. Let's take a look at that. Let's take this, uh, the Vitruvian man of uh, Leonardo da Vinci as our symbol for man. And let's take size going from left to right. And let's look at the big things larger than man. Lar well, this is a study of largeness. That would be the study of ast astronomy and astrophysics. The great discovery in that, in that direction is that it's finite. It doesn't go on forever. The universe is big, but fixed, finite. And uh, now, they know that originally, they assume, it, it, they also know the universe started. It began. That's what they, for lack of another term, they call a singularity. And that leads to conjectures of how did it start. And that leads to a collection of speculations called the Big Bang theories. And basically, they say, first there was nothing, and then it exploded. If that's logical to you, embrace it. But we also know that ultimately, it's all going to burn out. The universe is winding. It's been wound up. It's winding down. Uh, 
and there's ultimately a heat death. You see, heat flows always from hot bodies to cold bodies, right? We all experience that. If the universe was infinitely old, the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. It's not. So it's not infinitely old. It had a beginning. That's what leads to the whole Big Bang concept. And so it had a beginning. And that's, that's clearly understood. Lots of speculation as to what actually occurred then. Okay. But it's also designed for an ending because eventually there's good, the temperatures in the universe will be the, the temperatures in the universe will be uniform. All work is done by a difference in temperature. When the temperatures are uniform, no more work can be done. The uniform is over and it is destined for what they call a heat death. Now there are lots of different speculations about the Big Bang. There was originally a steady state model that was Einstein's biggest mistake in his in his words. But uh, then there's a hesitation model that was refuted in the 60s. Then they went to an oscillation model. It was expanding, then it's contracting, it's going back and forth. That's been refuted by the entropy laws and the lack of mass. There's an inflation model that's currently in vogue, except it requires anti-gravity forces that have never been observed. So all these are speculations of various kinds. But there is a stretch factor. It's interesting that we uh, can calculate that stretch factor by the uh, temperature of what they call the quark coefficient. But the point is, is if you take that stretch factor, and I'm indebted to Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who wrote the book Genesis and the Big Bang. I set out ready to Passover with him in Jerusalem years ago. The expansion factor generally regarded by scientists is about a factor of 10 to the 12th, so an expanding universe. Well, so if you take six, and they also believe that the universe is about 16 billion years old. Well, if you take that out, you know, that's six trillion days. If you divide that, uh, take that times 10 to the 12th days, but divide it by 10 to the 12th, you end up with six days. And if you take that as an exponential expansion, then each day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six would be, would be, uh, would, uh, would be uh, the perspective. This is also tied to the speed of light. We won't get into that here. But those are current conjectures. But I want to deal with this, this stretch factor in another way, stretching the heavens. I'll talk a little bit about the fabric of space. Is that just a metaphor in the scripture? You know, uh, Job 9, 8 says, who, speaking of God, who alone stretches out the heavens, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain, to Psalm 104. So Isaiah 40, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. All through the scripture, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah uses these expressions. He has stretched out the heavens. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, Zechariah, and so forth. There are Dozens of these illusions all through the scripture, stretching out the heavens. See, most of us have a misconception. We think that space is a vacuum. It's empty. There's nothing there. Not true. The scripture tells us it can be torn, Isaiah 64. It can be worn out like a garment in Psalm 102. It can be shaken. You can shake space, apparently. Um, Hebrews, Haggai, and Isaiah deal with that. It can be burnt up, Peter reminds us in 2 Peter 3. It splits apart like a scroll in Revelation 6. Here's a kicker. In both Hebrews and Isaiah, it says it rolled up like a mantle or a scroll. Space can be rolled up. We know that space has, today we know that space has properties. There's a zero point energy. There's permittivity and permeability. Every radio ham knows that because he's got to tune his antenna to the properties of space. And if you take permittivity and permeability, you have an intrinsic impedance of space, and you need to know that for antenna design. And the velocity of light is variable, we now discover. Uh, Barry Setterfield learned that from the scripture originally, proved it physically 20 years ago, was laughed in most circles of physics discussions until a few years ago. In fact, I had very well-meaning friends in the physics world take me to dinner, try to coach me not to fall into the trap of backing up the views of Barry Setterfield. And I smiled at that because the last couple of years, it's well known now the speed of light is slowing down has been changing, so it's not a constant. We'll come back to constants here in a minute. Rolled up. In order for something to be rolled up, there must be a dimension in which it's thin and an additional dimension, in a direction into which it can be bent. So if I take a two-dimensional thing like a photograph, to roll it up takes three dimensions. It takes an extra dimension to roll something up. If it's a two-dimensional thing, it takes three dimensions to do that. So there are additional... This is a clue that there are additional spatial dimensions. And uh, this leads to studies of hyperdimensions, which are uh, spaces of more than three. Well, it's interesting that Paul, when he writes his letter to the Ephesians, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints 
What is the breadth and length and depth and height to know that love of Christ which passes knowledge might be filled with all fullness of God? In his poetic weave here, how many dimensions does he mention? Breadth, length, depth, and height. Those are four labels, one of which can, is the Greek term that can mean time. A four-dimensional universe. And that was the discovery of Einstein, that time is a physical property. We live in four dimensions, not just three. Time is a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. We exist in apparently three dimensions, and current thinking in scientific circles is that we live in ten. And I think that we've just gone beyond Euclid. The most important lecture in mathematics was given on June 10th of 1854. George Riemann introduced metric tensors. It took 60 years for it to be applied practically, and that's the mathematics that Einstein used to develop his four-dimensional space-time, his famous theory of general relativity. He went, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he couldn't reconcile a couple of other factors. In 1953, doing exactly what Einstein did, postulating an additional set of dimensions, Close and Klein reconciled light and supergravity. In 1963, Yang and Mills developed the fields that uh, uh, harmonized the electromagnetic and both strong and weak nuclear forces. So there's been a progress here of adding dimensions from Einstein's four dimensions all the way till 1984, where now the current thinking, since then, various forms, is that we have ten dimensions. A vibration of superstrings is the current uh, uh, vocabulary to deal in that field. But it's interesting, there was a writer by the name of Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage that lived in the 13th century. And uh, he concluded from studying the book of Genesis that the universe has ten dimensions, only four of them are knowable, six are not knowable. Those are his words. And that, I find that kind of quaint and interesting because particle physicists today believe that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly measurable, three spatial plus time. Six of them are curled less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, which are uh, smaller than the wavelength of light, and therefore are discernible only by indirect means. Now what's fascinating about this is we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides discovered by doing his homework in the chapter of Genesis. But So we're talking about infinity on the macro side, Let's look at the other direction here a little bit. Let's look at the smaller side and let's explore, ex, 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 uh, explore the field of quantum physics. We've been on the largeness size. Let's look at the smaller size. That brings us into the field of quantum physics or subatomic particles. It's, we're going to study smallness a little bit. And we're going to discover something very strange that there is a limit to smallness. We realize there's a limit to largeness. The universe is finite. But we are shocked to discover there is a limit to smallness, and that doesn't make any sense to our thinking. The limits to smallness. See, the writer of Hebrews points out, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And uh, the model of the atom, we all made these in school, we take the simplest one, we've talked about a hydrogen atom, we've got a proton as a nucleus, and we've got an electron skirting around that. Now this is not to scale. The nucleus is in the center, the electron is as envisioned as spinning around it, and this is not to scale. Let's talk a little bit about scale. It turns out that the nucleus is about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters in diameter. The atom itself, in terms of the orbit of the electron, is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. It's much larger. By how much larger? By a factor of 10 to the fifth. In other words, to make a model um, of this to scale, I would have to make the nucleus the size of a pinhead and put the electron away the size of a football field. That's what it would take to make a model to scale, a pinhead in a football field. In other words, it's mostly empty space. But not only, this is just linear. The diameter is a ratio of 100,000 to 1. Well, if I'm going to look at that volumetrically, I've got to take that 10 to the 5th and cube it length with height. So that means the ratio of that pinhead is 1 to 10 to the 15th. Now, that's a number so big you and I can't grasp it. How big is 10 to the 15th? 
That's the same ratio as one second would have to 30 million years. If you go through the arithmetic, you'll discover that's about 10 to the 15th. One second to 30 million years. That's the ratio of solidness of a nucleus to an atom. That says if I say that this thing, this, this uh, podium is solid, and one of you says, no, there's nothing there, you are more correct than I am by saying it's solid. Because there's more nothingness here than there is solid by a factor of one second to 30 million years, 10 to the 15th. So why does it feel solid? Because it's an electrical simulation. The atoms, the electrical fields that make up the molecules of the, of the podium and the molecules that make up my hand collide and create the illusion of solidness. But it's an electrical simulation. And let's take a look at that. See, everything is made up of individual quanta, we discover. If I take a line, and I could obviously cut it in half and throw half of that other half away, I have now half that line, I can do the same thing again. Whatever I've got left, I can cut in half, and I can keep doing this, right? You would think at least conceptually I could do that forever. It turns out not to be true. When I get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, I find a very embarrassing discovery. I discover that if I cut that in half, it suddenly is everywhere at the same time. It loses a property that the physicists called locality. It loses locality. They now have been able to prove that every photon in the universe knows what every other photon is doing. They're somehow connected. And that's bizarre. It's so bizarre that uh, Boltzmann, one of the early quantum physics uh, discoverers, committed suicide. He couldn't handle it. He understood the implications of that. There is a plaque length of 10 to 33 centimeters, a plaque time. There is no period of time shorter than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. They're all, everything we know, length, mass, energy, time, are all made up of indivisible units. Called, that's why they call, it quanta, they call them quanta, and that's why they call this field of study quantum physics. Let's just talk about, uh, of constants here. Let, let's, I want to share something else that you, I think you'll find provocative. There are all kinds of constants in physics. You know, how many pounds to the meter, whatever. All kinds of constants. Most measures in physics have dimensions of pounds or length or energy or time. There are some ratios that are dimensionless. They hold true no matter what units you happen to be using to measure. Example, there are two dimensionless constants in the universe. One is called pi. All of us have experienced that in school. The ratio of a diameter to the circumference of a circle. Doesn't matter whether it's in inches or miles or light years. The other dimensionless constant is one that you probably have not run into unless you've taken a course in calculus or advanced engineering. It's a very peculiar number. Uh, it's the base of natural logarithms called E. E is just as well known to an, an, an engineer or an advanced mathematician as pi is to most of us. But they're both dimensionless constants. There are also two key verses in the Bible about creation. Genesis 1-1, of course, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and John 1-1, in the beginning was the word, and so forth. Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1. Two dimensionless constants, two key verses. Let's take a look at this verse. In, it opens the Bible, Genesis 1-1. Seven words, 28 letters. And, of course, it goes from right to left, being in Hebrew. If you take, and, of course, Greek and Hebrew, the two key ver uh, languages of the Bible, both have the unique characteristic that each of the letters has a numerical value. In the Roman alphabet, six of them do, not all of them. And, and, and that's, uh, but uh, have you ever tried to do arithmetic with Roman letters? That's another little exercise. But in Hebrew and Greek, each letter has a numerical value, which means each word has a numerical value. If you take the number of letters and the product of, times the product of the letters, and you take, divide that, by the number of words, the product of the words, you, strangely, you get pi to four decimal places, 3.1416. Now, most of us recognize that number from school, 3.14159, whatever. Some have just used 22 sevenths as an approximation, but that's, the, that's pi. To four decimal places, that's pretty impressive. You figure, well, that's just a curiosity somehow. Maybe that's fine. Uh, that's pi, of course. John Napier who lived in the, uh, uh, died in the 17th century, 
He would happen to be an activist for the Reformation, by the way. But he also is well known in the field of mathematics as the discoverer of logarithms. In fact, the natural logarithm, as it's called, is often called the Napierian logarithm. That's the log to the base E. It has some peculiar characteristics that prove to be very valuable, very useful in advanced mathematics. So E is a very key number. He's also the one that first used decimal points in fractions. So E in mathematics is the number most commonly defined by a limit of an expression that becomes large without bound. The limiting value of E is 2.718281828285, and on it goes. It's another one of these strange numbers that you encounter in advanced math. The number E forms the base of a natural logarithm. Now, it appears in as an exponential function uh, having the rate of growth equal to its size. In the language of calculus, it's the only function having a derivative equal to itself. But uh, be that as it may, that causes it to appear everywhere in mathematics. It's a necessary component in curves like a catenary. Uh, it's, 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 the, uh, it's a study in imaginary numbers that go on and on and on. It appears constantly in the theory of probability. And I won't bore you with all that. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's a number E appears in formulas calculating compound interest. If you go through a uh, theory of numbers, E crops up. It's the number of prime numbers, the first N numbers, if N is extremely large. Um, in wave mechanics, it shows up. In electrical theory, it shows up. In advanced math, it shows up. In uh, distribution of prime numbers, all these equations you incur in almost every field of study in the advanced math, you stumble into this strange number called E. So, uh, and it's usually approximated to say 2.7183, call it. Well, let's take the other wor verse that we talked about in creation, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Take that in the Greek and do exactly the same thing that we did with the Hebrew of Genesis 1. The number of letters times the product of letters, the number of words times the product of the words. And guess what? You get E to four decimal places. I was given this paper when I was in Europe, and I thought it was just one of these, you know, curi I get a lot of things handed to me, pretty strange stuff. But on the way back, I actually was so intrigued with it, I actually wrote a computer program to check it. And I used my computer. And it turns out, much to my amazement, it's true that you... If you do that with Genesis 1-1, you get pi to four decimal places. If you do that to John 1-1, you get E to four decimal places. That's precise. That's an astonishing level of precision. And this is fascinating to me because, you know, the, when you travel among some of the scholars, you discover that there are Hebrew scholars that believe not only did God create the universe, of course, but that the Torah was the template by which he did it. And you encounter those ideas and you smile as the colorful, you know, uh, exaggerations. Until you stumble into something like this, then you begin to suspect that just maybe the rabbis were closer to the truth than we gave them credit for. The non-constancy of constants. It turns out that Scientific American in June of 2005 had an article that expressed the concern by many scientists that the constants of physics they're beginning to suspect are not constant at all, that they're subtly changing slightly. And that's caused great concern, all kinds of experiments to try to confirm that constants are indeed really constant. What's fascinating about that, the reason I make reference to it, these are scientific American words, not mine. If indeed the constants are proved not to be quite constant, and by the way, Einstein, when he talked about light, he regarded light as a constant, but he admitted he would be surprised if there was anything constant in the universe. Everything's relative in his mind. According to this, these articles in Scientific American, if the constants are changing, that implies that our reality that we take for granted is but a shadow of a larger reality. They're words. And that's what the Bible's been saying all along. Hebrews 11.3, we looked at before. 1 Corinthians 15 deals with this. All through the Scripture, we speak of the physical world as a subset of something larger. For lack of a better term, we think of it as the spiritual world. The spiritual world is the real one. The one we're in is like a virtual game that we're playing. We're virtual people in a virtual environment is the net of it all. So we've looked at size. We put man in the middle. On the large size, we discovered the universe is finite in the macrocosm. On the small size... 
quantum physics, subatomic particles. It's finite, of small, limited in the smallness, microcosm. So if we take the whole thing, we discover that we and the universe we are in are really finite and simply a digital simulation made up of finite units. Nothing's analog. Everything is digital. And uh, so the boundaries of our reality, the metacosm, our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. The more you know about advanced science, the more conversant you are with the frontiers of science. If you can pick up The Road to Reality by Roger Penrose or books of that level, the more you know about the frontiers of science, the more comfortable Genesis chapter 1 reads. In our commentary of Genesis, we spend a full hour on each day discussing the technologies that are implied. How would you like to take a physics course with 1950 textbooks or 1970 textbooks or 1990 textbooks? Hardly. You'd be laughed at because they're constantly changing, improving. The Bible hasn't changed. Do you know why? It hasn't needed to. It's been right from the beginning. It's written by the designer of the whole enterprise. The first direct quote of God in the Bible, let light be. Let there be lights the way it's translated, but he calls it into existence. And that starts this whole tension between information and entropy. The scripture tells us the word of God is pure. And that's why we strive to study with a good translation, not a paraphrase. When you paraphrase it, you're losing the intent of the designer. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about advanced communication techniques. The more you know, most of you are, any of you are engineers, you know there are advanced techniques in communication. We exploit things called Fourier transforms and spread spectrum uh, techniques in encryption. That's exactly what the Bible does. In Isaiah 28, Who, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make understand doctrine? Them which are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept on precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And we see the same thing repeated a few verses later. The word of God, word of the Lord was unto them, precept on precept, precept on precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Have you ever noticed in the Bible there are no chapters devoted to baptism? Where's the chapter in baptism? Or evangelism? Or marriage? Or the Trinity of all things? Or heaven? Or hell? See, every one of these concepts is distributed throughout the Bible. And it turns out if you're a communications designer, you understand why it does that. It does that to make it immune to jamming. It's called spread, spread spectrum techniques to prevent hostile jamming. Let me give you a counterexample, holography. There's a provocative analogy I want to use some time here to share with you. If I take a photographic film and put a three-dimensional object in front of it, and I arrange a laser so it can shine on that film, and it can also, that same laser can shine on my object, what the film records, there's no lens here, you notice, there's no lens. What the film records is the interference pattern of the waves reflecting off that three-dimensional object versus the waves that are hitting it directly. Where they interfere, that interference is what's recorded. When I take that film and process it, it looks like a darkroom mistake. It looks like a fogged piece of film. Until I illuminate that film with the laser that created it in the first place. And I, what I get there then is a, a image, a three-dimensional image. It's actually, mathematically, it's a Fourier transform of the image. And so what I've redone is I've created the equivalent of a window into three-dimensional space. What do I mean by that? If I had a Bible here, and I held it up in front of my tie and asked you what kind of a tie I'm wearing, you wouldn't know if it's a photograph. If you took a photograph, you couldn't tell. But if it was a holograph, you could move your eye over here and look around my hands and see my tie to see it's what kind of tie it was. Same thing. Here's another example. If I have a three-dimensional space and I create a hologram, I'm really creating a window in that space. And as I move my eye, I can explore that space. That's why holog holography is such a powerful tool. Now, it requires proper illumination. 
It's useless in natural light. If I look at it in white light, it doesn't work. I have to use the frequency of light that created it. The information on the hologram is spread over the entire hologram. If I drill a hole in it, it doesn't lose anything. I can look around the hole to see what was there. It's not quite as sharp as it was before. The information is spread over the entire bandwidth available. There's no loss from dropouts. It's resilient to specific interference. There's no, easy, no way to jam that. So it anticipates hostile jamming. Why am I interesting that, that light, the attributes of God, are parallel to the attributes of light? Light with no parallax, is, it's like it's, in, it's equivalent to being located at infinity. So velocity is constant and implies infinite power because it's like, constant even after it leaves the media. Photons lack locality. That implies omnipresence. There's a fundamental revelatory mechanism. It implies the very attributes of God are reflected, in a sense, in the properties of light. It's interesting that James makes that remark. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. That word variableness in the Greek is the word from which we get the word parallax, by the way. But the main idea what I'm getting at is the Bible itself acts as a hologram. In natural light, it looks like a collection of myths and legends and so forth, a collection of traditions. But when it's illuminated by the Holy Spirit that created it in the first place, you see an image, the image of Jesus Christ. And uh, it actually is, operates like a Fourier transform. It's, tra it's transcendent of parallax. It's designed as if it was built by someone skilled in spread spectrum techniques, which is a defense against hostile jamming. Take the Bible, tear out a page. What do you lose? Some resolution, maybe, but you, you, the, 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 every key truth in the Bible is uniformly spread throughout the Scripture. You, you may lose some resolution, but you don't lose the image, the image of Jesus Christ. So the ultimate quest. You know, it's funny how many of these science fiction stories in uh, entertainment arena deal with trying to see the future. A recent movie called Paycheck deals with a, a, a guy that got into a project where by making a super lens you could you know get to see the curvature of space and see you could see the future and it's a, you know, the, the, just a, it's just a piece of entertainment but it's preoccupied with this quest to see the future the time has an arrow we call it entropy and we move forward we and we can look behind us that's us right we can what's behind us is history we move to, into the future we can't move back the attempts to do that of course result in paradoxes what happens if you move back and you kill your grandfather? You cease to exist. I mean, you get in those loops. And they're colorful, but they're just uh, uh, denied to you. But can you look forward? You and I can't, but there is one that can, and he uses that skill to authenticate his message to us. He actually writes history before it happens. See, our epistemological approach, epistemology is a study of knowledge, its scope, and its limits. And we've been, we're dealing here with how do we know what's true? And that's the ultimate challenge in technology, isn't it? The first thing we do with the Bible is to establish its integrity of design. We study enough to discover that these 66 books are replete with details that are designed in. from cover, Even though they're 66 books and they're penned by 44, maybe, anyway, over 40 guys over a period of almost 2,000 years. They didn't even know each other. And yet we discover their work product had evidences Incredibly skilled design where every number, every place name, even the structures hidden under the text are there by deliberate design. So first thing, we establish the integrity of that package. That's your first step. You can prove that. You can do that. You have to prove it to yourself. Don't take my word for it. Check it out and see. But once you've done that, you'll discover that that design presents a person. From the beginning, from Eden all the way through, a promise was given and details added and then fulfilled over 300 details in the life of Christ that we see in the Gospels. And so we, once you establish who he was, who he is, actually. You know, it's a, a, a Mel Gibson, the movie The Passion, did a remarkable job, except in many ways, except it has two serious deficiencies. It creates the illusion that the, tra that the uh, crucifixion was a tragedy. No, it was a, an achievement that was planned before the foundation of the world. The second thing it fa fails to get across is who he was. Not just a great teacher, not just some kind of influential person. No, 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 no. The creator himself incarnate. And that's what gives it its relevance. So once you, once you establish the integrity of the design, you can establish the real identity of the Messiah, of Christ himself. Once you realize who he is, he validated the whole package. 
And that's your that closes the loop on your epistemology, the authentication of it. So the ultimate message, provably of extraterrestrial origin, 66 books penned by over 40 men over 1,600, 1,700 years, with the integrity of design that cannot be simulated, even with a computer. There are properties to the biblical text that you can't even simulate with a, a supercomputers, astonishingly enough. That's how you can prove the last 12 verses of Mark were part of the original, not added by some scribe, and so forth. Okay, and therefore, it has to have come from outside time itself. It is indeed, the thing in your lap is an extraterrestrial message from the Creator Himself. And you can prove it. See, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, the Old Testament is translated into Greek three centuries before Christ is born. Let's use that as an anchor point. Those, that corpus of text has 300 specific prophecies dealing with the coming Messiah. The Old Testament prophecies in the Old in that just the ones that are quoted in the New Testament. He was to be of David's family all through the Scripture. He would be born of a virgin. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would sojourn for a while in Egypt. He would live in Galilee, in fact, specifically in Nazareth. He would be announced like an Elijah, by an Elijah-like herald. Uh, he would, that would occasion the massacre of the Bethlehem's children. He would proclaim a jubilee to the world. His mission would include the Gentiles. It's all written in advance. His mission would be one of healing. He would teach through parables. And he would be disbelieved and rejected by the rulers. In fact, he ex executed. It's all in the scripture. Let's just take the last week of his life. He'd make a triumphal entry in Jerusalem. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He would be, uh, 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 would be like a smitten shepherd, all the sheep scattered. He would be given vinegar and gall to drink. They would cast lots for his clothing. He would be, his side would be pierced. His, not a bone would be broken. The whole picture of crucifixion was detailed, written like in the first person singular in Psalm 22, 700 years before crucifixion was invented. The official form of execution in Israel was stoning, not crucifixion. He would die among malefactors. His dying words were foretold. He would be buried by a rich man. He would rise from the dead on the third day, and resurrection would be, his resurrection would be followed by the destruction of Jerusalem. All that's laid out in the Old Testament more than 300 years before the actual deeds. Now, there are over 1,800 references in the Old Testament to Christ returning to rule on the earth. 17 books of the Old Testament give prominence to that very event. There are over 300 references in the New Testament. 216 chapters deal with Christ returning to rule on the planet earth. 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament give prominence to the event. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming, they're all there and they're all fulfilled. For every one of those, there are eight of his second coming. And uh, the bulk of the... Uh, and so we have monitored, our institute has monitored for several decades now, strategic trends, the struggle for Jerusalem, the Magog invasion, the rise of a European superstate, the rise of China, the, uh, the, the movement towards a global government, the, the movement towards an ecumenical, one-size-fits-all one religion. The, the advent of global pestilence, the decline of the United States as a major world power, and of course weapons of mass destruction. Each one of these are profiled in the Bible. Each one of these are moving in accordance with that scenario. It's not any one of these, it's all of them converging. That's why I give a challenge to most of our uh, uh, readers. It's a preposterous statement I'm going to make, and if you accept the statement I'm going to make, you flunk. I want you to challenge this that you and I are being plunged in a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now, to challenge this, you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible really says, not what I say it says, not what some preachers know. Find out yourself, what does the Bible really say? The second thing you've got to do is find out what's going on. The more you know about your Bible and the more you know about what's really going on, the more you'll see the convergence to the, the big climax that's coming. Now, there are resources available to you. I'd like to talk about this a little bit. We take for granted the ease with which we handle information, making copies and so forth. In the ancient world, all copies had to be copied by hand. That's why we call them manuscripts. That's where the word comes from. It was the invention of Gutenberg's press and movable type that really uh, uh, changed the history of the world because it ushered it, these printing techniques ushered in the opportunity to have the Word of God in the hands of the average person, not squirreled away among priests. And so his, his movable type inaugurated 
the world that made the Reformation possible. And so there are technologies available today that's going to, that are changing the world even more so. The technology of today, the information appliances that we have in our hands. I didn't bring my PDA here. In the I left it on my desk. But uh, the information appliances that we have. I ran the Ford Motor, Com Ford Motor Company Computing Center in the middle 60s. And I carry under my arm when I travel more computing power in my laptop than I had responsible for when we had a uh, $125 million rental built at IBM at the Ford Motor Company back in the 60s. It's astonishing to see the power that we take for granted in our appliances today, our computers, our, pers you know, our PDAs, our podcasts, and so forth. Kilobytes, gigabytes, terabytes, we would have given our uh, left arm for an extra 32,000 words of memory back in those computer days. And today we have on our keychain four gigabytes and a little stick. It's staggering. Today, if you study your Bible, you can go to the original text, Greek or Hebrew, without knowing Greek or Hebrew. If you're on a computer, you put your little cursor over the word you're curious about, it'll immediately pop up and tell you what that word that's translated, what the Greek or Hebrew word actually said and what it means. It'll do that for you. You don't have to spend four years in seminary learning Greek or Hebrew. The computer will do that part of it for you. I travel with more, more volumes in my laptop than our, that populate most seminary libraries. And it's word searchable. There are many volumes that I don't have a lifetime to read all. I don't need to. The computer will find what I'm after and summarize it for me. And we have the Internet. We have now friends that you can have fellowships of people all around the world. Our students are now in something like 20 countries on the issue. Fellowshipping, sitting in virtual classrooms, discussing the scripture. And we have unfathomable resource. Now, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's, that's noise and nonsense, of course. But there's some, you can find out anything you want to know if you know how to use these resources to you. And you have fellowships now that are borderless. Now, there are MP3. We've been at the cutting edge of this, DVDs. The, if you haven't studied, the, discovered the Blue Letter Bible, it's free. It's on the Internet. You can click on any verse, and it'll give you the concordances. It'll give you a list of audio and uh, study tools, concordances. It'll give you maps, images, different translations, dictionary aids of all kinds. You can click on them. And uh, there's computer software you can put on your own computer. And there's, and there's one terrific package that's free. doesn't cost you anything. And there's other major companies that have invested a fortune in uh, arranging the kinds of tools that are now available, where it'll tell you everything, and, uh, uh, what's going on behind the scenes. And you can click on this, and it'll analyze it for you, compare it, and so forth. It'll even take a document and tell you what is the relevant part of that document by statistical analysis of the vocabularies and so forth. And you have maps and all these things. One of the interesting things are PDAs. A little In my phone, I'm sorry, I left it on my desk. But my phone, I have six Bibles. And I can look up the Greek or Hebrew, what have you, in my little phone. Carry it with me. So I can, I can steal 15 minutes when I'm early at an appointment. I can use that time. But there's something else that goes on here. There are packages, you know, obviously, that eSword again, and several firms that specialize in supplying Bible aids for this kind of environment. And they are very similar to the kinds you have on your big computers. Okay, but uh, one of the most interesting things are, are podcasts. Most, many people now have an iPod for music or whatever, or even movies. If you put that in your charging thing, it's connected to your computer on the Internet. You can download it. It can automatically download the Bible study for the week, and it can put that into your podcast, in your iPod. So you can automatically, anytime you're, you'll have the current week's Bible study right there for you, or devotional or what have you, all automatically. So, see, with information... If true, it should preempt all your other priorities. And it should preempt it with an urgency that is too important to be delegated to the misinformed. This is too important to delegate to anybody else but yourself. Find out yourself what the Bible says. Find out for yourself what the implications are for you. And you can now discover and then validate these realities in the privacy of your home. You don't have to sign up for a course on 7.30 Tuesday nights or something. You can do it on your own clock in your own home. We encourage you to start with learning the Bible in 24 hours, 24 one-hour sessions. It'll take you through the entire Bible and be accompanied with about 1,400 computer-aided diagrams. And you get on DVDs or other things. You can get university credit for it if you like. But first, a strategic grasp, then book by book, verse by verse, by, and by study. And you can do this on your, by self-study if you're strong enough to do that. 
Most of us profit by doing it in a small group, a small face-to-face -face group, where you can ask questions without embarrassment and hold each other accountable. And some of those groups can't. And you can also get university. You can do that in such a way as do it face-to-face -face and also, also get university credit. And you can also do it on the Internet in a virtual classroom with where the, people, the 12 people in your class will be from Israel, from Finland, wherever. And so we encourage you to check that out. That's what we're all about. The Lord bless you.